In this video, I'm going to try and get a VGA video interface for the ZX Spectrum Turing Edition to work. As a teenager, before university, I considered myself a self-taught hardware person. My story was actually pretty similar to Dave Jones from EEV Blog. The Talking Electronics series from the early 1980s was a major Australian icon for electronics enthusiasts. Despite a very simple presentation style, it was incredibly informative and affordable for a teenager. So I want to put out a special thanks to Colin Mitchell and his team. If you're listening, thanks, and I personally learned a lot from your efforts. Back then, even before university, I'd built a number of 8-bit systems, mostly Z80 based, though I did experiment with a few other microprocessors too. But funnily enough, despite majoring in computer science with a couple of years of electrical engineering thrown in, I never once learned about raster generators in my bachelor's degree. As far back as I can remember, I've always been interested in how computers generated images, even simple text on a TV. Early in high school, my school had one Apple II Plus computer, which I had about five minutes of access to once or twice a week, but I was really more interested in the technical manual. It had schematics, but at the time, I couldn't quite figure out how it generated the display. What really changed everything for me was the TRS-80 technical reference manual I borrowed from a friend. It has an incredible 16-page section on raster generators. That was the real light bulb moment. Later, during my PhD, I revised my interest in raster generators, combining that early knowledge with what I'd learned about 3D graphics at university to develop this bad boy. Yes, it's point-to-point -point soldered, and yes, I soldered every joint, and yes, it worked. It's called an address recalculation pipeline, and it was the first ultra-low latency graphics controller specifically designed for virtual reality, and a software version of it still used today. This paper about how it works is still being cited 30 years after its first publication. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see me do a series on it. In the early 1990s, Pauline Van Damme was considered the Bible of computer graphics, and just as a piece of trivia, the third author on the second edition was Steve Feiner from Columbia University, who is an expert in virtual reality, and he was actually one of my PhD thesis examiners. Thanks, Steve. Henry Fuchs from the University of North Carolina was my other external thesis examiner. He's one of the pioneers of virtual reality and 3D graphics hardware, particularly the Pixel Planes architecture. That journey took me to the architecture team at NVIDIA, where, for a while at least, I worked on the RAST generator for the Tesla family and beyond. So, in a way, this simple circuit I fell in love with as a teenager followed me during my career. Anyway, back to this circuit. You don't need a university degree to understand how these machines work. While a degree can add polish to a solid foundation, this material, and most of what's on this channel, isn't even taught at university anymore. To really get it, you rely on projects like this and series like Ben Eater's to see how the fundamentals come together. We've built EEPROM based raster generators on this channel a few times. If you really want a deep dive, I recommend you watch this 25 minute Commodore 64 video, but here I'll try and compress it down to 3 or 4 minutes. We start with an EEPROM and we make it synchronous by latching its output with D type flip flops. Next, we loop some of those outputs back to the EEPROM's address lines. That turns the EEPROM into a finite state machine. For the Commodore 64 demo, I mapped each state to a single unique minute in a 24-hour digital clock. I used 7 bits for minutes and 6 bits for hours so I could output binary code a decimal cleanly for each digit. Columns are minutes and rows are hours. A tiny program pre-computes the next minute from the current one. Wrapping minutes around at 59 to 0, and hours wrap around from 23 to 0 at the end of the day. Hook up a few 7 segment displays, and voila, a working clock. You can watch the left 2 digits count from 0 to 59, then reset, and the right 2 digits count from 0 to 23, then reset. Excellent. Now, Take that exact same finite state machine hardware and just swap the EEPROM contents. For video timing, instead of counting to 60 in 7-bit binary coded decimal, we count columns to 57 using 6 binary digits. So we get 57 groups of 8 pixels per line, and we extend our rows 
previously ours, at 262 using 9-bit binary. A single NTSC field's worth of lines. That leaves us one extra output bit, which I'll use as the sync bit. I assert that sync bit once per row for five columns, and once per frame for two rows. This gives me horizontal and vertical sync signals. Clock that circuit at video rates, say 895 kHz for the character byte clock. 895 kHz times 8 pixels per character gives us a dot clock of 7.16 MHz. Run the sync bit through a simple analog combiner, and the TV will lock onto it. Each finite state machine state now represents the position of eight consecutive horizontal pixels. Next, I add a little decode logic for the active display region, that red box you see. When I feed that through the analog chain, you end up with a white rectangle on the screen. That's the ZX Spectrum's active area inside the full video frame, which I'll need as a gating signal. Blocks are cool, but pixels are better. The Spectrum stores this bitmap at 4000 hex, one bit per pixel. We need to add a simple frame buffer source to our raster finite state machine. The choices include a dual port RAM, time multiplex static RAM, or for bring up, an EEPROM with a test image. I'll use the EEPROM for now. The EEPROM gives us eight pixels in parallel, but the display needs a serial bitstream. Enter the 74HC166 shift register. Load one byte each character tick at 895 kHz and shift it out at the dot clock, which is 7.16 MHz, and that byte gets converted to eight consecutive bits. Drop that into the schematic and connect the output to the analog composite signal generator, and bingo! You get a pre stored image of Jet Set Willy on the TV via an NTSC signal. The best part? It's the same finite state machine. Flip a couple of switches, and you're back at a 24 hour digital clock. In an earlier series, I built a ZX Spectrum clone using a Z80 but no ULA. The real goal of that project was to see if I can get a raster generator working with really simple logic that still gave me a VGA output. For today's build, I'm using almost the same design. If you want a full deep dive, check out that earlier series, but let me give you a fast schematic walkthrough here. The biggest change this time is that I'm running two static RAMs, one for the CPU and one for video. That just makes life simpler while I'm debugging. And honestly, Debugging is always harder than design, so I always lean towards debug-friendly prototypes rather than chasing the perfect final design first try. I'm also trying out two 8-bit EEPROMs for the raster generator. No magic reason, just to prove that it works both ways. Inside, the finite state machine code is identical to the last build. Here are the EEPROMs, and here are the state registers. Now, the ZX Spectrum video layout's a bit quirky, with a bitmap buffer at location 4000 hex and an attribute buffer at 5800 hex. The upper byte of the video address has to flip between bitmap and attribute buffer every 8 pixels. To handle that, I've got a pair of 74HC257 multiplexes with tri state outputs. Here's the interesting bit the lower byte comes out of the flip flops, goes back to the raster generator EEPROM, then onto the video static RAM address lines. The upper byte also loops back to the EEPROM, but then goes to the multiplexes, and from there it drives the video static RAM addresses. Because the CPU and raster generator both need to hit the video RAM, I've added output enables, so the multiplexes only drive the video address bus when they're meant to. Over here on the left, I've got the usual support logic, sync, interrupts, all the boring stuff we've seen before. I've already built this unit off camera. Honestly, YouTube stats tell me people tend to drift when I film every solder joint, so I might break builds out into a separate video in the future. But here we can see the key parts. The EEPROM, the Octal D-type flip-flops, and the address multiplex is all wired in. Next section down, 
On the left, I've got duplicate memory address registers. These mirror the CPU address memory registers when the CPU writes to the main memory. Here's the video static RAM. Remember, the RAS generator reads and the CPU writes. The 74HC373 latch is basically acting as a tri-state buffer in transparent mode, but it means if I want to get fancy later, like I did in the Commodore 64 build, I can. Pixel data comes out of the static RAM first, so I latch it into a register, then fit it into the shift register at the end of each 8 pixel character. Attribute data comes out just in time, so that only needs a single buffer. That feeds a set of 4 to 1 multiplexes, selecting between ink, paper and background. Add some AND gates for high and low intensity, then latch it right next to the VGA port. And yes, I've got a blanking signal in there to protect H-Sync and V-Sync. The last piece, the clock circuit. It's the same as I've used before. A 28.636 MHz crystal oscillator. A 74HC161 binary counter. A little logic to generate the extra pulses I need. And finally, a 74HC574 to line everything up in phase as tightly as I can. That's the schematic. Let's fire it up and see how it performs. So I've powered it up, and I got this signal. Hmm, maybe there's some Jet Set Willy there, but it's certainly not correct. Then I noticed that the image changed as I waved my hand above it without actually physically touching anything. Because CMOS chips have such high impedance inputs, waving my hand above the circuit causes enough interference to change any input if it's not being driven by anything. Basically, this is an unconnected input somewhere until proven otherwise. I looked around with the logic probe, and it didn't take me long to find that many of the upper address lines into the EEPROM are floating. Now these address lines are being driven by two 74HC257s, and there we go. The output enables signal for these chips is also floating. From the schematic, it's meant to be connected to CPU clock. Sure enough, when I looked underneath, there's supposed to be connection between pin 1 of this octal D-type flip-flop, the output enable for the 257s. I put that wire in place and. Excellent. We have the correct bitmap. The colours are wrong. This tumbling thing, whatever it is, is meant to be green, not red. This green guy here is meant to be blue, so I think I've just jumbled up the colour signals going into the VGA port. I fixed that up, and it looks good. Now, I still have this line of junk over here on the left. That's because I need to delay the active signal by one character clock, but I'm starting a bit tight on real estate for the board, so I'll just wait to see if there's any spare flip-flops I can use at the end. Okay, let's evaluate where we are in the project. We have the video circuit working with a pre-computed image stored in an EEPROM, producing a VGA signal, which I must say actually looks really good. No banning at all so far. On the right, we have the Turing machine being clocked rather slowly by the Arduino, but it's getting past the ZX Spectrum memory test and displaying the opening credit. I know it gets stuck here without a keyboard connected. In the next video, I'm going to try and pull these two pieces together and see if I can get Matic Miner running. That'll give me a good idea as to how fast the Turing Z80 runs relative to the actual Z80 and what I need to do to make the timing more accurate. In the meantime, don't forget to like, share and subscribe.